Okay, great. So I'm Karen Cangelosi, and I uh, wear many hats, but I'm being sponsored by the Rios Institute, that w for which I'm a fellow, which uh, stands for the Institute for Racially Just, Inclusive, and Open STEM Education. And I want to talk to you today about open science, and many of you probably already know what open science is. It's about sharing all the stages of the scientific research practice openly, from your hypothesis formation, through open, putting your methods out there, putting your data out there, publishing openly, having open peer review. And um, UNESCO has a little bit of a deeper analysis. You probably can't read all of this, but basically, if you were to look closely, they're talking about how open scientific knowledge is also connected to um, the need for scientific infrastructure, um, interaction with society more broadly, and connection with other ways of knowing, including indigenous knowledge. And they talk about how open science is not about making sure, is about making sure not only that scientific knowledge is accessible, but also that the production of that knowledge itself is inclusive, equitable, and sustainable. That, that's the ideal. Um, so why do science openly? Often you'll see a lot of things that are cited for why to have your science open and out there. And, and again, in this community, you probably don't need a lot of convincing, but um, making scientific practice more effective by promoting interdisciplinarity, collaboration, work across borders, including physical borders, increasing the range and extent of our knowledge, amplifying our collective intelligence. And I love this one, increasing our cognitive diversity and that there can be a greater chance of breakthroughs. Openness can be the sunlight that helps identify unethical behavior and questionable research practices and address the reproducibility crisis in, in research. Um, people often cite societal benefits more broadly, that just the public has access to knowledge. We can move science away from being dominated by commercial interests, that we can increase public trust of science and scientists. And so the question is, you know, if, if all of this great stuff is true about open science movement, and the open science movement is not new, it's been around for decades, in fact, um, why is there the lack of the adoption of open science more broadly? Why is the majority of scientific practice in the world as it's conducted today still closed and, do, and, and mostly directed towards private interests. And there's a lot of different reasons for this. Some people cite the lack of incentives for promotion and tenure. We were just talking about that in the last few talks, right? A pressure for publication quantity, like you have to have a lot of publications to be recognized. There's disinterest in negative results and results that aren't original if you're just gonna reproduce the same kind of study. Awards for individual superstars, not for collaboration, in fact. Um, fear of being scooped. I'm not going to put my idea that out there because you're going to steal it and you're going to get the credit instead of me. Right? We see where all this is going. Concerns about standards. The research isn't good enough. You're not going to follow the IRB process. Um, and in the words of NOSEC, as a state, like what's good for science isn't necessarily good for the scientist's career. And, and this is the problem, right? Like what is the system that we are perpetuating? And so Along with this, open science could actually exacerbate current systemic inequities, not address them, in spite of the fact that equity is an often cited reason for why we should do science openly. In fact, cumulative advantage is, is a real thing. If you're already successful as a scientist, you're more likely to get that recognition and reward. There can be abuse of women and scholars of color. When data is put out there, who's going to be more likely to have ideas taken advantage of? Um, vulnerability of sharing data, that's not good enough by those that haven't already been well established. Um, open data can be used to invade privacy, can take away rights, it can oppress others. Um, open data can jeopardize data, data sovereignty. Um, vulnerability, not just of humans, but of, of other non-human species, of protected species, populations and areas. By making this information available publicly, it jeopardizes our, our non-human relatives. And so, um, basically, you know, why is there a lack of equity? Well, there's been a real lack of a thoughtful architecture for how these existing inequities in scientific research practice could be addressed in the transition to widespread adoption of open science. And a lot of the, um, <clears throat> a lot of the efforts to actually promote open science have almost entirely been aimed at established scientists, right? Who are the ones that have already been successful? Who are recognized? Who know how to play well in this system? Who've been trained? Who've been indoctrinated in this system? And then we say, give all that up and do your science openly. And in fact, it doesn't seem to be working too well because we don't see the widespread adoption. 
And so I'm trying to make the case here is that in order to transform scientific practice to be not just open, but equitable, socially just, and in service of the public global good, um, it, this requires a real cultural shift, right? Like, so what does it take to, to shift cultures? And so I'm making the case that what we need is a substantial transformation in our systems of science education for undergraduates. So I hope all the community college professors are listening to me because like where does most science education happen in, in those kinds of classrooms? And so, you know, why am I saying we should target undergraduates? And uh, in, in the words of uh, Hannah, who's a study uh, by her and her colleagues that I'm gonna show to you in a minute, um, students who are our future scientists, right? Not the ones already indoctrinated, um, have long been catalysts of social and political change, right? And so we need to think about how we make our classrooms places where we can ignite our students to be those catalysts of social and political change. Um, and so Hannah and her colleagues, actually, when I went out there and said, who's doing open science in undergraduate classrooms? The only two real published studies I could find were both from Canadian institutions, um, and they may be out there at other places in the world, but I couldn't find them. And this, this particular, excuse me, this particular study, which is about fully implementing open science um, in terms of practice and values and how to do open science, um, they, they even followed this up by uh, surveying students at the end and say, say, how likely are you to do open science if you could? How much would you like to be able to do it? And like 98% or more of all students in the two different studies said, yeah, we would love to be able to do open science. So I think, you know, being able to influence students is, is an important thing. One of the things I also wanna make a case for is that we need to connect our programs of open science with other movements in science education reform, in particular about decolonizing science education and also the transformation of science education to be directed towards sustainable development. So William Kyle, who wrote this study, along with others, have made the case that we have to, we have to stop teaching science in the standardized way that we do right now, right? Like, using grades and using standards and using this universalism and there's only one way to learn and to do science is actually counter to what we need to be doing in the world to address global challenges. And in fact, Kyle makes the argument that our, our science classroom should be entirely directed at solving problems that humanity is facing, like all of the time, not a side project. You know, and I'm making the argument, not, not like an open pedagogy side project, but the crux of your classroom is about social change. And we don't really have time, right? Our planet is literally on fire. And so youth are demanding action, and science educators ought to be able to enable learners and communities to transform and reinvent the world they are inheriting. So just like Hannah, he's making the argument that youth are making the call for change, right? And so why are we standing in their way? Why do we have the youthful energy and the hopes and dreams of people that want to change the world, Greta Thunberg and the like, then we get them into college classrooms and we say, no, wait a minute, cool off, just slow down, you're not gonna do that, now you're gonna memorize this stuff. And so we're basically putting out, instead of igniting the fire that we need our science students to be able to have. <clears throat> and so, again, connecting with a decolonizing scientific education, nothing is gonna change until we really think differently about why we're doing science. You know, and, they're, and they're talking about science education to actually combat so the science for domination, right? And they write, we argue that mainstream science education is contaminated by neoliberal values and functions in the service of political domination and exploitation, and that a neoliberal and exploitative science education does not contribute to the building of a sustainable and just world. <clears throat> and so, you know, I made this slide before I heard today's talk, but it's like, it's about braiding, right? Like, how do we bring together open science education together with science education that's directed at sustainable development and social transformation, again, primarily, almost entirely, and interbraid that with with the decolonizing science education movement. Like this is what we need to do when we're thinking about how do we prepare our next generation of scientists? What is it that these scientists are gonna do? And so <clears throat> what I'm suggesting in the, in the open education conference here is that open pedagogy can be that catalyst for transforming science education. Right? How we can bring all of these ideas together. We talk about these things all of the time in the open science, I mean, in the open education world. Why aren't we bringing open education and open science together more? 
and therefore we can transform scientific practice, and therefore we can actually address these global problems that, that we are facing as a society. <clears throat> and so I'm just going to give you a few examples because there's a lot of different ways of thinking about what open pedagogy looks like. And again, I don't mean let's do a side project in open pedagogy, but let's make that philosophy of open pedagogy about what your class is about which is about letting students make choices of their own design, about letting them decide what they think is important, about them learning what they need to learn and allow them to actually solve the problems that we all need to have solved because, again, we don't really have a lot of time. And so domain of one's own is one place where we might be able to see this, right? Empowering learners to interpret and speak and share from their own perspectives. Right? especially marginalized learners, like exhibiting that epistemic stance that um, Hodgkin Williams had talked about. Um, Wikipedia is an often cited tool of open pedagogy. And I just wanted to point out like this example of an organization called whoseknowledge.org, and you should look them up because they're a global campaign to center the knowledge of marginalized communities. And one of the tools that they're using is Wikipedia. And imagine like going in and looking at what they're putting up on Wikipedia, how they're trying to use this, the biggest OER in the world, right? Like you can connect your classrooms with projects that are already happening and connect this to your science education and frankly any other discipline that we're talking about. Um, here's an example of some podcasts that were created by uh, Carlos Gallier students at North Carolina State University where their uh, students are talking about things online, they're putting stuff out in podcasts. You know, this is at once open pedagogy, open science, and science communication. And tools like these can also be connected to um, citizen science. And I just want to end with a quote from um, Catherine D'Ignazio and Lauren Klein who wrote the book uh, uh, Data Feminism. Um, and uh, teaching data like an intersectional feminist. And they ask, like, what if we imagine teaching data, and you can put science, you can put humanity, you put anything else in there, what if we imagine teaching data as a place to start creating the connected, collective, caring world that we want to see? So, thank you. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. And so I was going to say, how the heck are we going to do that? <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I'll say, like, I'm asking my own question, how the heck are we going to do all this? Well, how are we not going to? Like, what else are you going to do? Are you going to hold up standards because somebody else, and I, you know, and I get it. But, yeah. Okay, yeah, so the question is about like, um, not all of us are in context where we can just sort of take everything and throw it all out and start over. Um, and that sometimes we have to start slow, we have to add pieces in. And um, you know, I've, got, I've gotten a little bit less patient in my older age of like, yeah, we've been starting slow, we've been adding pieces in, and you know, a decade or two has gone by. And I get it, like it, you can be in a precarious position. But not everybody is. You know, I wanna, I wanna make a plea to those people that have privilege to leverage it. Right? Like to take the situation that you're in and, you know, we talk about accreditation boards, we talk about promotion tenure standards, we and we're like, we act as if those things were handed down to us from God, right? Like who writes promotion and tenure standards? Who creates accreditation boards? Like all of the humans that are us, that are in this system, that continue to perpetuate those systems. So wherever you are in your career, like when you get to the point where you got a little bit of power, that's what I'm saying. That's when you need to intervene and stop and say, no, we're not going to do this madness anymore. Because frankly, we don't have time. <laughs> I don't know if I'm out of time. <laughs> Speaking of time. Yes, okay. Thank you very much.